Hello and welcome to our weekly Biblical Reflection video. It's good to be able to share with you in this way, even with all that's going on throughout the world with the COVID virus. Today we will be continuing our series looking at the life of Joseph in the book of Genesis. Finally, we are going to read of the reunion of Joseph and his father Jacob in the land of Egypt. On Sunday, the 25th of October, the in-person worship service will be at Ollerton Congregational Church, starting at the usual time of 10.30am. But before we come to our Bible readings and reflection for today, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. As we hear it and think upon it, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to hear you and respond with faith and obedience. Hear our prayer, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Bible readings uh, again this week come from the English Standard Version of the Bible and our first reading is taken from Genesis chapter 46. Uh, I'm going to be reading two uh, fairly short sections uh, this time. So we're going to be reading verses 1 to 7 and then picking up again at verse 26 and going through to verse 34. Uh, you might want to pause this and read the whole chapter if you like, um, just to get the bigger picture. But I think that a lot of the details are ones that uh, we can kind of gloss over in a sense. So Genesis chapter 46, verse 1. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night, and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again, and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. Then Jacob set out from Beersheba. The sons of Israel carried Jacob their father, their little ones and their wives, in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They also took their livestock and their goods, which they had gained in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt, Jacob and all his offspring with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, all his offspring he brought with him into Egypt. And then verse 26 onwards, all the persons belonging to Jacob who came into Egypt, who were his own descendants, not including Jacob's sons' wives, were sixty-six persons in all. And the sons of Joseph, who were born to him in Egypt, were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob, who came into Egypt, were seventy. He had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph, to show the way before him in Goshen, and they came into the land of Goshen. Then Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, in Goshen. He presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go and tell Pharaoh and will say to him, My brothers and my father's household, who were in the land of Canaan, have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, 
what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth, even until now, both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Our second reading today comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2. And I'm going to be reading from verses 13 to 15 and then 19 to 23. So Matthew chapter 2, starting at verse 13. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfil what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. And then verse 19. But when Herod died... Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose, and took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, and he would be called a Nazarene. Last week, in Genesis chapter 45, we left Jacob with his sons, having just been told that Joseph is in fact still alive. After many years of grief, believing that Joseph had been devoured by wild animals, Jacob can look forward to seeing his son again soon, once the long journey down to Egypt has been completed. There are, of course, a few unanswered questions here for Jacob. What must he have thought about the infamous coat of many colours being smeared in blood? Where has Joseph been these many years, and how did he get there? Did the brothers admit what they'd done to their father? We don't know the answer to any of these questions. But again, we must trust God that these are not the important ones for us. Interestingly, in our reading today, though, we find Jacob stopping at Beersheba first before heading down to Egypt. If we look back through the book of Genesis, we find Beersheba first being mentioned in chapter 21, where Abraham, Jacob's grandfather, made a covenant with Abimelech, a Philistine king. He had previously used seven wells that were located there, but had then had the use of it taken away by the Philistines. The agreement with Abimelech now allowed him to use these wells once again. There is a further reference to it when Jacob's father, Isaac, came to Beersheba during a time of famine and received the promise of God regarding the land and becoming a great nation. It certainly seems to be a significant place in the stories of the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. In our reading today, God appears to Jacob in a dream and reminds him of those same promises that he had previously made to Abraham and to Isaac in their times. During his stop stop off at Beersheba, Jacob makes sacrifices to God. This in itself is actually, I think, quite interesting because the law has not yet been given to God's people. 
that is still a few generations away. In fact, something like 500 years away. At this point, the Israelites do not have God's commands about how and why they should make acceptable sacrifices to God. Yet, they make sacrifices to him anyway. Reading between the lines, God, I think, must find these sacrifices acceptable. And yet, of course, there is only one sacrifice that God truly finds sufficient. The sacrifice of his only son, Jesus Christ, on the cross in our place. In verses 3 and 4, God speaks these words to Jacob. I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again, and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. During the famine that we referred to uh, a short time ago, during the time of Isaac, God had specifically told him, that is Isaac, not to go to Egypt. But here, in this time of Jacob, um, God gave him the specific command to go down to Egypt. Notice how God promises Jacob that he will go with him to Egypt and bring him back out again. What we as Christians know as a daily reality, Jacob experienced as a special promise from God, his presence with him. If God is with us, and he is, we need not be afraid, whatever might happen. Thankfully, in the scriptures, we have the wonderful promise of God that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And on that promise, we can depend. Going on, we are then given a description of who travelled down to Egypt with Jacob and his sons. And in verse 26, we're told that there were 66 descendants in total, if you exclude the wives of his sons and perhaps various servants and so on. Now, that's rather a lot of people to look after and provide for in the land of Goshen during this time of famine. It's interesting that the number of them is noted, although I don't know why that is. It's intriguing and probably coincidental that it's the same number as there are books in the Bible, but I'm not going to read too much into that. We're then told of the emotional reunion of Jacob with his long-lost son, Joseph. There are tears, joy and contentment at what God has brought about. It's good to remember that all this has happened because God is sovereign over all people and circumstances and that God's providence is also in evidence here. The chapter ends with some really quite odd remarks about the Egyptians seeing shepherding or those who tend to sheep as an abomination. Why is this, we might wonder? The short answer is that we don't honestly know, although scholars have a few tentative suggestions why this might be so. One seemingly prominent thought is that the Israelite way of sacrifice was an abomination to the Egyptians because much of the meat was burnt because it was a pleasing aroma to God and because of that, of course, was not available as food. As much, if not all, of the meat eaten in Egypt at that time was meat from sacrifices to the Egyptian deities than to raise sheep and cattle for burnt offerings and food separately would seem very strange, wasteful and distasteful, especially in the prime grazing land of Goshen. I understand from the uh, history uh, of Egypt that Goshen is where uh, Pharaoh's own um, herds and flocks would be kept and cared for. 
So the fact that uh, Joseph's family is given this land of Goshen is actually quite a privilege. But whatever the reason for the Egyptians considering shepherds to be an abomination, it's clear that this was a distinctive between Israel and Egypt. There was something different about God's people. Perhaps instead of worrying too much about this, though, we would do better turning our attention to the parallels between Joseph and Jacob travelling to Egypt and God's son, Jesus, fleeing to Egypt many, many years later. Our New Testament reading is a part of the nativity story, the story of Jesus' birth to Mary. And it's a part that we often tend to skip over uh, at Christmas time. Even so, there are, I believe, some important points to note. Firstly, we should see that God specifically directs his people to safety and provision in the land of Egypt for a limited time only, before bringing them back to the promised land with a great purpose. In this time of sojourning or um, keeping themselves um, safe in Egypt, what was basically an extended family of 70 plus the wives of Jacob's sons, so maybe 80 or 90 in total, these people grew to be a great nation in the 420 years they were there. Israel was to become God's special covenant people. Although we know next to nothing about the time that Mary, Joseph and Jesus spent in Egypt, perhaps in some ways it too was a preparation for Jesus' ministry. That ministry of Jesus, of course, was to proclaim the good news of the kingdom and preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In the promised land, God established his first covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, which would come to fruition through the 12 tribes of Israel. Also in the promised land, God would establish the new covenant through the shed blood of the perfect, spotless, sacrificial lamb, his son, Jesus. As great a story as the life of Joseph and his family may be, it is but a pale shadow of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have something much greater than the promise of being a great nation offered to us. We have the promise of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. God fulfilled what he had spoken through the prophets, which again assures us that God is in control and we can trust him. Whatever we face in this life, let us remember that God is bigger than it all and can do that which is for our good. What a wonderful God we follow and serve. Amen. Thank you for watching our video today. My hope is that God would use it to draw you onwards in your walk with him, wherever you may be. Let's pray now. Father God, we thank you for your word and for the promises that you have given to your people down through the ages. We thank you and praise you that you set aside a people as your very own and have called us to be your people. Thank you for the offer of eternal life that you have set before us through faith in Christ. And thank you too, Lord, for saving us from the wages of our sin. Be with us today and in the days to come. Remind us of your promises to us in the scriptures and keep us trusting in you. These things we ask now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for watching. Please consider hitting the like button, subscribing to this YouTube channel if you haven't already done so, and leave any comments you may have below. 
God willing, I hope to see you again next week. Goodbye.